You are listening to This is Oklahoma, hosted by Mike Hearn, telling stories of Oklahomans and those that have made it their home. This podcast is made possible by the Made in Oklahoma program, created for Oklahoma's entrepreneurs. Their free-to-join program focuses on economic growth and development for the small businesses who grow, process, or manufacture a good within Oklahoma. Retail stores who sell Made in Oklahoma products can also benefit from their program. Above all, they encourage you to support and shop local wherever possible. Find them on Facebook and visit their website at www.madeinoklahoma.net to learn more. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma. Mike and here, your host, back with another episode coming to you from Weber Falls today in Oklahoma with uh, Brent and Valerie Madding to talk about the, I guess, wonderful elderberries that they grow. Uh, guys, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. Uh, before we dive into everything, I uh, looked at the website and all the products that you guys sell and the wine, and it looks very tasty. And on a Monday, which we're recording this, I would love a glass of wine right now. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime, come see us. Uh, it's wine through. For sure. Uh, but before we get started, you know, with a lo- little bit of context for everyone listening, how, how does, how do you guys meet and how do you end up in Oklahoma? Well, I'm, I originally grew up on the land where our farm is. This is home to me. Mm-hmm. And she and I met um, many years ago um, in junior college. I was on a baseball scholarship and she was there uh, getting all of her minor stuff taken care of and we met in junior college in 1977 mm-hmm. i believe it was and been together ever since yeah so three about kids and originally i am actually an air force brat so i was born in oklahoma that's where my mother's family is from in southeastern oklahoma around tishmingo and uh but i got to live in a lot of different places and ended up uh going to high school and college in Oklahoma. So it was, it was an interesting life. Yeah. So, so growing up, what, what were you guys think? Like, what was the plan when you guys were growing up? Like, what were you going to school for? What were you kind of planning to go into, in, into kind of, Brent, I assume you were with the farm and stuff and going into growing up on the land and working in agriculture. And then I guess, Barry, what were you doing? Well, actually, Brent was, was running away from being a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's, that's where 360 Farms comes from, because yeah. my life comes full circle. <laughs> yeah, he act, Brent actually uh, ended up getting a degree in biology with a major in plant science, so that, that fit him well for what we're doing now. I uh, originally was going to go pre-med for something like physical therapy and ended up being a special ed teacher for many years, so that's right. our story. Yeah, so uh, I mean, we'll dive in. That's where the name comes from. You, you growing up on the farm, I wanted to get as far away from it as possible, and now we're back to it. When I was 18 years old, I lit out of here to dead run. <laughs> uh, my family were uh, had a fairly large cattle operation, and we farmed for the cattle. Mm-hmm. And it was just not something I saw in my future. I needed to get away. When we came back, you know, for, we were very fortunate to have some property. And uh, where our farm operations is located is on 40 acres that uh, my grandfather actually obtained in the 1940s. Mm-hmm. And uh, my family has used this for running cattle and haying and whatnot. And uh, when we came back, I just I tried to find something to do because I'm a busybody. And I, that's kind of where this all came to be. It just we needed to, something to do on the land. Yeah, that's uh, that's awesome. Uh, my dog going crazy in the background because my wife just come home, so she's going. If you can get my dog, <laughs> off that's all right. We have two right outside the door. Uh, yeah. Um. So, so we're growing up on the farm. Where does the I guess passion for biology and plant stuff come in? Right. If you said you know with you grow up cattle farming and stuff, how do you mm-hmm. transition to wanting to get? I, I was very fortunate, and and I, as a teenager growing up in a farming community. Uh, We had an extraordinarily good FFA program, and our ag instructor here just, he lit a fire under me about a lot of things, and plant science was one of them. 
And uh, I, I, I just cannot say enough about how fortunate I was to be part of that program because he was a fantastic man or is a fantastic man. We're fortunate to still have him. Yeah. Yeah. I think one, I, I think it's something that people in general, right. Just uneducated about, you know, the, the, the great benefits there are from, from certain plants and our diets and everything else. Right. Like it's, exactly. You yeah. just grow up, you don't really you learn a little bit about it in school, but you know, you don't really dive into it. And, you know, unless you, you know, you with the metabolism when you grow up, you can eat anything you want. Right. And then you get to, you know, late twenties, early thirties and you're like, I need to like legit have a diet now and understand that I can't have <laughs> double cheeseburgers and pizza every day. Uh, well, I, 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 I credit Valerie to a lot of what we're doing now because, and I've told this story many, many times and it is the gospel truth. When she came into our relationship, she had and still has her grandmother's herb books. Yeah. And through our marriage of 40 something years, she'll pull out an herb book, try to, well, let's say the trip to the doctor and see what we can do with an herb. And I, I honestly, at first I would roll my eyes to a lot of it, but she has proven time and time again <laughs> that this stuff really works. And so she kind of got me on that path of, of eating well and eating the right foods and looking to nature first. And, you know, we didn't do that with our kids. We, we treat our kids with her, her books. So I, I guess I was fortunate in that, in that way. I'll be sick. Well, I just turned 63 years old and I absolutely take no medication. I don't know if it's my genetics or what, but it has a lot to do with how you take care of your body. Yeah, definitely. That's uh, that's one thing that I'm slowly learning. <laughs> it's how <laughs> I know you notice it when you get the you know, if you take a diet, you take a strict diet, you know, for for a long longish period of time, maybe a couple of months, and then you get back to eating how you did before you started the diet. You realize how bad that food is because you instantly feel bad. Uh, yes, yeah. I don't raise cattle, but I do enjoy eating them. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, uh, we, uh, we also have here, I don't, I don't know if you were uh, told, but we also have what's called an aquaponic greenhouse that we use to uh, both grow our elderberries and also to, to grow the different uh, medicinal herbs that we use in our products. And the aquaponic system creates, it, it produces some really, really good vegetables. And uh, what we have come to find in the 10 plus years that we've been here and been using that is that we don't want a salad anywhere else because it tastes so, so bad after what you're used to getting from your, from the, the system that we have. Yeah. It, it'll ruin you. It will ruin you. So I, I do want to clarify one thing she said though. We, we do not grow elderberries in our aquifer. No, yeah. We propagate them. We actually start new baby elderberries in it, but yeah. we, we grow our commercial production uh, plants out in fields. Yeah. So I just wanted to clarify that one point. Yeah. So, so you, you've been doing this for 10 years. Uh, tell me about, take, t tell me about the period before that, right? You, you know, you, you go to, you go to school and you're into plant med, biomedicine, stuff, bio, stuff like that. Where, mm -hmm. where is that college mm -hmm. the 40, 50 year old period? Like what happens during that period? Well, t taking care of kids and raising a family, <laughs> doing what we needed to do. Uh, I, I had been self-employed. I, I had a business prior to this, and I'd reached a point where I'd, I use this term, aged out. It was to the point I physically and mentally couldn't do it anymore. I lived out of a suitcase. I, ha I kept a suitcase packed 12 months out of the year, and yeah. I might get a phone call tonight, and then I needed to be in um, Michigan in two days and didn't know when I was going to be back. Sometimes it was overseas, too, and I'd be gone for months. And it finally got to the point I couldn't handle it anymore, so I came home one day from a trip, and I told Valerie, I said, I, I, I need to find something to do with the rest of my life. Yeah. And we were very fortunate. Our, our middle child, our oldest son, Zach, um, always had health issues. He was just never a healthy kid. And he started experimenting with this aquaponics and it intrigued me. It wasn't something I wanted to do on a large commercial scale, but he suddenly went from being unhealthy all the time to being a, a, a prime specimen of health. So I was intrigued by that. So when we were 
in the planning stages of coming back to Oklahoma, come, for me coming home, um, we were actually looking at how we could utilize aquaponics. Mm -hmm. And we built a, a, a 1,700 square foot flood and drain aquaponics system with the idea of growing medicinal herbs and uh, on a commercial scale. Mm -hmm. Now, that whole system has evolved tremendously since then, but that was our first idea. And what happened is we, we'd actually run on to an article put out by the USDA many years ago about over-collected wild medicinal plants that were uh, to the point of becoming extinct because they were so over-collected in the wild. So we built this system thinking that we could help that situation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it just kind of, it's evolved in that 10 plus years now, it's, it's almost 11 years. A lot has evolved and changed since then, but that was our initial plan when we came into this. Yeah, for, for myself and maybe others listening, explain the aquaponics system, what it is exactly. Well, basically, it's a it's a 365 day a year production greenhouse, okay. and we, the nutrient uh, demands in it is fed by fish waste, and we actually have a whole big tank of water in there, about seven thousand gallons, with several hundred koi fish. Now, what I tell people is the koi that are living in our system are the same fish we put in there now almost 11 years ago. And because koi are ideal for this, if you're not looking for a supplemental crop such as meat fish, then we didn't want to do that. So the koi actually do their business in the water. There's a bacteria that lives in this system that is identical to what lives in our gut. It breaks food down to a molecular level. Plants uptake that nutrient and they clean the water and the water is goes right back to the fish 24 hours a day and that goes on and it's such it's such a nutrient dense system it functions sometimes too well but yeah it's just hard to keep up with sometimes but that 1700 square foot greenhouse was what we initially started with we also found out that it was ideal to propagate in other words start new plants, either from seed or whatever. We do a lot of propagation with elderberry plants for our nursery operation, and we use it in there to propagate clone cuttings, basically is what we do. We also just, we do grow food in there, but it's mainly for our own use, but it's also a sample to a lot of the agritourism that we get here. School kids, whoever, college kids, people are just interested in thinking outside the box. They'll come and tour this and we'll show them, you know, you don't really have to grow your food in dirt. You can actually grow it in a system and you can do it 365 days a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the aquaponic system came first before the nurse. Yes, it did. It did. You know, we, we built the aquaponic system. We said, well, now that's great. That takes up 1,700 square feet of 40 acres. What are we going to do with the rest of it? Because cattle was out. <laughs> so uh, really, I'm going to be honest with you. We, we, we've always been interested in something called superfoods. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that gets tagged to a lot of different foods that we humans eat. Yeah. And I, I started looking at some of them. Could I farm? Because I've got a little bit of farming experience. Could I farm on the additional acreage that we have? And, I, and honestly, I had decided that I was going to grow blueberries. And I, I spent some time with Oklahoma State University and their horticulture program and come to find out I had an ideal place to grow blueberries. Um, my soil was perfect and everything. It was just going to have to provide a lot of irrigation. And I, I had spent some time figuring out what varieties of blueberries I needed and all this. And I, had, I literally had on paper an order for 4,000 blueberry plants to put in the ground. And I hope my friend listens to this, but the night before I was going to order 4,000 blueberry plants to put in the ground at our farm, I talked to a good friend of mine who at the time was living in Chickasha. And he said, now, before you do that, he said, you ought to look into something called elderberries. And I thought, OK, well, this is what I know about elderberries, jelly and wine. That was it. Valerie uh, and I spent literally 48 straight hours on the internet looking at all this new research into this new superfood called elderberries. And I threw my blueberry order away and literally overnight I was now a boot, an elderberry farmer. So it was kind of interesting and exciting and, you know, 
we never imagined 10 years ago when we started this that we would create a whole new business and industry out of this and now a, a winery we, we just never saw that when we started this yeah that's fast. It was kind of, yeah, it was the, the, the coming up with our own line of products was um, necessary for us because uh, the first, uh, I guess maybe the second season, second summer when we actually had something to harvest when the plants started producing, we realized that the, the logistics of getting our, our bulk elderberry crop to a processor was not going to be feasible when we started so real life. Someone had not looked yeah. at the the, yeah. the logistics and the financial expense of doing that. So yeah. we just had to take a step back and say, what can we do in house? Because the, just that infrastructure investment, Oh, we didn't plan for that. So let's, you know, we had some time to think about it and we started doing some research on exactly what is being done with this plant, not necessarily the berry or the fruit, but what is being done with it. And we spent, Oh, what, two years looking at all different things all over planet Earth and what's being done with this plant and found out that, man, there are just a myriad of things that we could do here that no one else in the United States at that time was even attempting to do. And we had a native plant that is happy in Oklahoma. Trust me that. Yeah. But, you know, so we, we started looking at that. And, it, and that's created its own little issues, of, you know, and in, in starting a business, getting it off the, you know, off the ground and things like that. You know, how do we do this? We had to learn a lot of new languages. You know, packaging is a good example. Um, you know, we knew that we wanted to put it in a bottle. But what's that bottle called? So, you know, it, it was a lot of painful experiences but it's been fun challenging at times it's been fun yeah well and re super rewarding right like once you get that finished product whatever that product is you know if it's a well yeah, we, we do this a lot you know when someone comes here or someone's interested in one of our products i explain to them i said here's the thing we grow we harvest we process and we package mm -hmm. everything in here and every single fruit or whatever we're selling you goes through these hands, my hands. And that's how we control the quality. You know, well, I, initially my business model, if you want to call it that, uh, one, of the, one of the things at the very top, I said, I do not want any employees. And, you know, I just didn't want to deal with the hassle of that, you know, finding people and keeping people and, you know, that's how I can say, you know, what you're buying from us has passed through these hands and I'm able to control that quality. Now, fast forward 10 years, our business has grown to the point, And as I mentioned earlier, I'm 63 years old now. That idea of not having any employees, that, that has changed. So, yeah, I'm, I'm fortunate that we do have a lot of, I don't know how to use the right word here, but country kids, you know, they're used to farming and working hard. And we, we've been fortunate in, in finding um, some young people to help us here. And it's been a great experience for us. And uh, especially if we can find kids that are already interested in this line of work, like horticulture and things like that. So it's been, you know, some things have changed, but yeah, it's been interesting. Yeah. Right. Good. Well, because it's not just a job for them, right? They're learning something that they're that's right. That, like that's right. Actually using yeah. it. They're going into a degree at OSU or whatever. That's right. Yeah. That's right. It's kind of like yeah. an internship, really, than more of a job. But yeah. So, yeah. Well, go ahead. I mentioned earlier that I was really heavily involved in the FFA program, and that's one of the first things I look for when when I'm looking for someone who might be interested in helping us here is, you know, how involved are you in your FFA program? And uh, I, I just I, I can't say enough about those kids that come through that program. It's just it's, it's just some exceptional young people. Yeah. So 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 when you when you have all these, you know, the, the berries need to be processed and you'd see the cost and you think hang on a second we can build this and it'll save us in the future and invest in something and you think wine can come from this what other products are you thinking about at that time because you, you know you're looking you think wine jelly and then you know just the other great things that elderberry can be used for 
what are the stuff that I guess the long list of things that you were thinking, hang on, hang on this, we can sell these products. I'm interested in what didn't make the list, right? Well, well, find it well it's not what didn't make the list because when we first started this, we, you know, oh, wow, we can go down this way and we can go that way. And finally, uh, maybe two or three years ago, Valerie and I said, we have to put on blinders because there's only so much we can do. And uh, I'm fortunate that I'm tied enough tied into the the industry enough that I, I catch little snippets about demands. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that we do here is we sell a lot of nursery plants for new elderberry farms. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a lot of people that come to me and they're interested in elderberries and growing them on a commercial scale, uh, but they don't quite know what they want to do. You know, do they want to be a commodity grower and just grow them and give them to someone else to turn them into products, or do they want to do that themselves? One of the first things I tell people is that the demand is so great right now that this can be an in-house business for a lot of people. And if I see people that are, you know, if they're really on the ball well enough about what their plans are, I'll say, have you thought about this? I turn them on to certain ideas in the industry. And it's simply because Valerie and I just, we can't take on anymore. We just physically cannot. But as far as products, I was sitting here thinking of all the things we thought, hmm, I wonder if we could do this or that. Yeah. Um, uh, I, we had an idea uh, a couple of years ago about uh, we should, somebody should make elderberry shots, you know, just a single use, set it up at the counter of every quick trip in, in the state, mm -hmm. you know, elderberry shot, if you're feeling beaded, I guess I think that would do really well. Right. So I'm still waiting for someone to come out with that one. Um, we have, uh, we have some good friends that are growing elderberry in Texas now. Who got all their plants from they did, yeah, farms. <laughs> they got the plants, but, but they, I think are looking at uh, producing an elderflower vodka. So I'm anxious to see how that goes for them. Uh, uh, I think it would be from, you know, anybody that's got some distillation knowledge, it would probably be pretty successful if they come up with some kind of an elderflower brandy, I think could be really successful. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's just, it's just, uh, there are so many ways to go with it. I think that, that I could probably make uh herbal tinctures and sell them all day long, but it's really kind of, uh, I, I don't do that because it's iffy on the licensing. I'm not sure, you know, I'm not real sure how legal that is to be selling that alcohol. So we just kind of, you know, stayed away from that one, but somebody that did have that licensing, that's, I, that's something. That we I tell the story uh, a lot. <laughs> and I don't remember how many years ago it was. Uh, there's a young lady named Megan Markle that married one of the British princes, which one? Prince Harry. Harry. Prince Harry. Yeah. And they announced in the media that she, her wedding cake was going to be an elderflower cake. And in Europe, that, that's a fairly popular thing. They, they bake a lot with this plant. You would not believe the number of phone calls that I got here, people wanting to know how to make an elderflower cake. Not only that, florists suddenly wanted elderflower bouquets for weddings. It's just, you know, it's just constant new things coming up. That's mad, isn't it? I guess yeah, it is. So before the Royals had their cake, how, was the demand always there when you started or was that just something that's just kind of come? Recently? No, it, you know, it so, was for, for very health conscious people. It was. Okay. Um, now, social media has just gone crazy yeah. the last three or four years. Uh, I've actually tried to keep track of the number and the amount of um, demands that I have for bulk product that the marketplace needs. Yeah. And a as an industry here in the United States right now, I know for a fact we're not meeting 10 percent of the demand right now. And uh, the price just you know, for either wholesale bulk and or on the retail level just keeps going up and up and up. Now, back to products, you know, um, when we decided to take a step back and look at what we could do in house, my wife is a hot tea drinker and uh, we found out that there was a lot of herbal teas be being made with elderberry and elderflower in Europe. And I thought, well, hey, we can do that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, we had a aquaponics greenhouse that could produce 
you know, medicinal flavoring herbs year round, which we still use it that way. And so she started coming up with these blends. Now it was my uh, job to come up with how do we harvest an elderflower? How do we get it to that point of being in an herbal tea? So we had to develop that whole process. And it took us about a year to come up with something that would work. And not only that, I had to have certain licenses, health department, the state of Oklahoma was one of them. So it had to be something that they could put their stamp of approval on. So in coming up with that process of those herbal tea blends, um, I, I'm working those dried elderflowers. And at the end of the day, I, I looked at my hands. I'm a farmer. I mean, they're calloused and whatnot. And I, I went to Mallory and I said, look at my hands. My hands were as soft and supple as they've been since I was six years old. It was phenomenal. Then we started doing some research and found out that this plant had been used for skin care for centuries yeah. in Europe. It's even documented back to ancient Rome. No one was doing anything with that here in the United States. So that's where our skin care came from. It was simply a, a side effect, you know, it was a mistake, actually. It wasn't expected. So yeah, the, all of our skincare came from that, just processing it for herbal teas. Yeah, that's, yeah. It's, it's amazing how, like, just everything kind of, you know, bring comes together. And then, like, you look back yeah, at yeah. you guys and, and just, you know, growing up on a farm and then not wanting to do anything about it, right? Not wanting to be, not, don't want to be in the cow. It's too much work. Uh, and then, you know, going into the medicine side and the bio side and plants and, and just, like, you have this land, let's do this. And, 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 you know, you come with the aquaponics center and it's, I love doing, this is why I love doing this podcast is because you hear so many of the stories and how everything comes around and people listening now will get the whole 360 name, you know, and they'll understand mm -hmm. why you do what you do and, and why you have this. And it's, it, you know, it, it just builds the story. It's great. Um, so you have obviously the market as well, right? People can come out and buy stuff from you. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, is there anything in there that we haven't talked about? You mentioned the teas and the, the, the you know, the skin. Well, the wine, wine. the wine situation was uh, not something that was anywhere on our radar when we first started this. And we were actually part of Oklahoma Ag Day years ago, the one in the state rotunda. And our state senator came out, who was Roger Thompson. And uh, Roger seemed to be very, very intrigued by what we were doing because it was something brand new. No one else was doing it. And we were using a native plant, native to Oklahoma. It's not something we were bringing from China, trying to grow on the ground here in Oklahoma. So, you know, almost the first words out of his mouth was, are you guys making wine? And I said, oh, no, you know, I wasn't anywhere on our radar. And so we got everything established with our business. And, and one day we got to thinking about it. Well, we could do this. You know, I, she told you earlier, I have a degree in plant biology. I also have a degree in chemistry. And so I thought, well, I can figure out how to do this. It's just simple organic chemistry. And so we started playing with it and realized, you know, we could make something that no one else offers. And uh, we spent about um, two years collecting all the equipment that we would need and uh, almost that same amount of time just filling out the paperwork. Everybody wants you to fill out to become a winery and uh, got the federal approval, got state approval. And, a little, you know, we got everything in place to be a production winery also with everything else we do. And literally, um, we were obtaining our last two licenses in Oklahoma City the very week that the nation went on lockdown. <laughs> so, you know, that was kind of a rude awakening. So we just kind of took a step back with our winery and said, oh, well, let's just kind of take it as it comes. Let's don't throw out a big um shingle somewhere and say come to the winery let's be careful but it's been really good and we've had a great reception to that winery mm -hmm. and you know we get a lot of people out here to the farm for a lot of reasons either they're interested in aquaponics or interested in elderberries whatever the case may be and uh, we get people out now we have wine so they can do all just about anything they want to do here do you ship your products as well if people can buy online you ship them away or do you have our elderberry products we do ship yeah. Uh, oh, my. We do not have a shipping license for our winery yet. Okay. Working on that. Well, yes, exactly. We're working on a lot of things with that. 
<laughs> That's awesome. Uh, anything else specific that, that I haven't asked you that, you know, you guys are super proud of or, or something that, that yeah, you know, I, I, I will mention this. Um, and I, I, I do several presentations during the year about growing elderberries. And one of the things that I like to tell people when I'm doing my presentation is this, I'm most proud of what we've done to the ecology here on this property. Um, the land where our farming operations is has been a, a basically cattle and haying operation for 70 some odd years and the land was used and abused and worn out. Um, when the, to the point that I said I was going to plant elderberries, I actually had to, I won't say ask, I had to tell my brother to get his cattle off. And uh, the land was just in, in horrible shape. And now fast forward 10 years, uh, we've managed to get all the native tall grasses back. They've come back. Our, our wildlife, insect, and reptile population is back to phenomenal levels of where it's supposed to be. We don't use any herbicides or pesticides on our farm. Um, we've actually had quail unlimited here to try to figure out why quail like living, bob white quail like living in elderberries because our, our quail population at 360 farms is phenomenal. So we're very, very proud of that. Um, lightning bugs, fireflies is another good example. In a lot of areas, they're actually very threatened. But you can go out this May right now, you can go out at, uh, at dark here at our farm. We have hundreds of thousands of lightning bugs. And it's simply because we decided to put this land back the way it was supposed to be, all natural. And we're using a native plant to do it. So that's what I'm most proud of is what we've been able to do to the land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's some special stuff. And then, then, like I said, after 10 years, you get to see everything, right? The transformation, you see it every day. Yes, yes, exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so for people listening that haven't understood what we've been talking about, you know, the elderberries and elderflowers are extremely good for you. Uh, any advice for people who've never tried it or tasted it? Like what was the best way for, for them to get into it or daily regimen that they should take, you know, shot every day? Or, I mean, what do you recommend? Well, a lot of people, you know, right now are very, very interested in, in nutrient dense foods and things get labeled as superfood. And here's what I'm going to tell you. If you take what defines a blueberry as a superfood, elderberries are three and a half times better for you. Antioxidants, um, what's that? Polyphenols, uh, all the vitamins, are extraordinarily high. Now, antibacterial, antiviral. Yes, I hope you heard that. Antiviral, antibacterial. A lot of research has gone into it. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm going to answer this. This is kind of more my ball of wax than his in some ways. Uh, preventively, yeah. yeah, absolutely. You should be taking a shot or drinking a cup of tea or something. Somehow get some elderberry into you just as a preventive measure uh, because, I mean, it's boosting your, immune system. boosting your immune system, keeping it functioning well. And, and as Brent said, polyphenols are a heart healthy thing. So you're just, it does a world of good for a lot of different things that we also, uh, I have a lot of fun telling people that what we primarily harvest here is the elderflower. We harvest elderberry, but we harvest more elderflower because there are so many uses for that, even medicinally or nutritionally. And uh, so uh, it, elderflower is great if you have uh, allergy problems, you know, congestion, stuffy nose, stuff like that. It really does uh, help with that. So uh, we try to tell people that, that, uh, you're not going to fix what's wrong with yourself maybe in two days like you will with an antibiotic, but it's a long term taking care of, you know, taking care of what the problem is. So, um, yeah, I, I, if we could just get everyone to understand if you do this preventively, you wouldn't need it nearly so much uh, as a reaction to having the flu or having, you know, what bronchitis, whatever it is that you're struggling with. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a really good thing. And I hope it gets to the point where more people understand that, you know, it's, I had, a, I actually had a, a, a post that I put on Facebook several months ago that said, if you don't take the time to take care of your wellness, you will be forced to take care of your illness. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of the mindset that I hope more people start getting. Right. Yeah, I'm back to, you know, you're talking about a daily regimen and whatnot. You know, it depends on uh, 
per, people's personal taste. You know, we have, we have a, a tonic which has uh, elderberry juice in it, and you know we recommend something like a tablespoon a day. Um, then the teas that we make has a lot of different ingredients, elder, elderflower, elderberry, and a lot of flavoring, medicinal herbs. You know, we have people that, uh, I mean, they every day they'll drink two cups of tea, one in the morning and one at night. And it's just what they do. Instead of taking their medicine that has been prescribed from the doctor, that's what they, they take their tea. So, you know, it just depends on what your personal taste. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of different ways to take it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, awesome. Well, guys, I want I want to thank you for for spending thirty minutes of your time to to share some stories and and some definitely great insight. For everyone listening, I'll post the link to the website three uh, hundred and sixty okfarms dot com in the description as well as the social media pages, Facebook and Instagram. And yeah, if you guys and the address as well, if you want to swing by and grab yourself some wine uh, or some other products and check it out. But guys, thank yeah. you so much for joining me and for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy so, cheers. This podcast is made possible by the Made in Oklahoma program created for Oklahoma's entrepreneurs. Their free to join program focuses on economic growth and development for the small businesses who grow, process or manufacture a good within Oklahoma. Retail stores who sell Made in Oklahoma products can also benefit from their program. Above all, they encourage you to support and shop local wherever possible. Find them on Facebook and visit their website at www.madeinoklahoma.net to learn more. Thank you for listening. We are inspired by those around us and hope that you are too. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review so we can keep telling your stories. For more great Oklahoma content, follow This Is Oklahoma on Facebook and Instagram.